So a lot's been happening. Yesterday was my first post-operative checkup and I went in and it was kind of funny, like everybody's just kind of, I mean, I know them pretty well by this point. I've had five pregnancies now, my God, five. And uh, <laughs> by this point they know me. So I went into the office and I was saying hello and they're, they're smiling at me like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. They're like, okay, not feeling depressed? No, no, I'm not feeling depressed. Um, found out that significant blood loss can cause fatigue and depression. And so that's that's actually a thing. Like if if the if the loss of the baby doesn't get you, the blood loss might. <laughs> and um I actually feel I feel very good considering everything that's happened and I suppose that's a good thing um, it's actually slightly worrisome to me sometimes because I look at it and it's like well do I do I feel too good you know do I do I feel too okay with everything that's happened you know my concern is always that I just didn't care enough I always look at it and it's like well did, did you ever really care it's like well yeah I cared I know I cared might not show that I cared, but I cared. It's kind of like, well, similar to the blood loss. It's like if you lose a bunch of blood and you nearly die and you're not upset about it, does that mean you didn't enjoy your life or value your life? It's like, no, I valued my life. I just didn't get upset by massive blood loss. The way, I guess I was supposed to, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> But the good news is I'm not, not depressed. So that's, that's good news. And then I called up my aunt today and we talked a little bit about some things that she had experienced when I was quite young, actually, I think a teenager, I can't remember when. Um, my aunt had two sons and her first son died at one year of age and her second one i can't remember how long he lasted he didn't make it all the way to one year of age and you know she and i started talking about our experiences with our with our babies and she she and her husband were very they took a very aggressive approach to care of the baby. Their goal was to keep the babies alive as long as they possibly could. And she was telling me stories about staying in the hospital and, you know, resuscitations and seizures and things that she had had to go through with her situation. Hers wasn't trisomy 18, it was something else. Um, but she was telling me these stories and and it was actually really sweet. She was telling me the stories about, you know, the fond memories. If, if that, that sounds like you wouldn't have fond memories from something like that, but the fond memories of, you know, special things that she and her husband would do for each other while they were in the hospital, like with the baby, because you know, you and your husband are together in this, you and your partner, usually a husband if you're doing something like this, you're together and you, you comfort each other and it's, it becomes one of the bright spots in all the darkness. Years down the road, you look back and it's like, remember, remember that time that things were really horrible and you did that thing for me that was just so nice, like some, some little gesture of kindness. And it stands out as just this wonderful, loving moment years and years later. I mean, it really says something about marriage, like the whole in sickness and in health thing. It's big. <laughs> it's really big. You make those vows and they're big. And so, you know, she and I were talking about the decisions that we made with our pregnancies and with, you know, her baby and me with my pregnancy. And she and I had 
completely opposite ways of handling the situation. Like she, she had this very aggressive approach to preserving the life of the baby as much as possible, you know, medical procedure after medical procedure, let's make this work. And I had the exact opposite reaction where it's like, okay, the baby is almost certainly going to die and I don't want to pres I don't want to pursue an aggressive medical approach which means that the baby is definitely going to die if the baby is going to die how can I make that as humane and kind as possible so I never even met my baby I I remember I had an option of two different procedures and I chose one that would like one of them was induced induced abortion, induced labor. I forget how they how they term that. Um, basically, you, you induce labor and you give birth to a stillborn. And I had that option and I ended up taking, I ended up taking the other route. And at the time I remember thinking about it, it's like it's not important for me to meet the baby. It's important for me to make sure that he's for some reason in my mind I kept thinking okay, even though I know he wasn't going to be okay. <laughs> I need to make sure that he's that he's as comfortable as possible because he's going to die and death is not always a comfortable thing so I want him to be comfortable and my aunt said one of the most interesting things she's gonna send me some of her 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 writing on on everything that happened like some of her you know personal writing and then because I asked her if I could share her story. I wasn't going to do that until I had her permission. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping to get some emails from her with some of the things that she's written about her experience and hopefully hopefully share those with you guys to, you know, if you're if you're trying to figure out how to handle a, a really, a really bad pregnancy, um, but hopefully that will help you to, to figure out what you think is best. But one of the things she said to me that was really interesting is, you know, you can look at her situation, you can look at her situation from the outside and come to any number of conclusions about who she was as a parent. You know, you can judge someone from the outside because she, you know, she, she put her babies through a lot of medical procedures in order to keep them alive. She's like, you can, you can judge me for that. But it's, it's a whole different situation when you're the one making the decisions and you're the one in that situation. And she, it was kind of funny to me because she said that on her own. And that's, that's a, exactly what I've thought about that. Um, you know, I, I took the other extreme. I chose to abort the pregnancy and you can judge me on that. You can judge me pretty harshly on that. <laughs> I've been judged pretty harshly on that. But when you're in the situation, it's it's just different. I mean, even now when I look when I look at it, I feel the the distance from that situation. Um and it seems like a growing distance. You know, I, I can still look back to the thinking and the logic that got me to the decision that I made. And at no point when I look back do I say, oh, if only, or oh, I wish I had. Um, I mean, there were a few things that I, I, I could have done better. Um, <laughs> I probably could have saved myself a, a lot of suffering if I had not attempted to go to an abortion clinic. That was not a good idea. Um, that complicated things a bit. It all worked out okay, though. And I'm very grateful that it all worked out okay. And I look at my recovery and how well my recovery is going and how much energy I have and how I just don't feel sad. I mean, I, I did feel sad for a while, but it was never I'm sad because I picked abortion. It was I'm sad because my baby died. But those two aren't necessarily the same thing. My baby was going to die. I tried to find him the good death. And I feel like I did that, so... I'm sad, but I'm also not... But I'm also not... 
plagued by guilt. I think, I think after listening to my aunt's stories, in some ways, I ended up getting the easy way out. You know, on the one hand, I never got to meet my baby. I never got to see him. I never got to hold him in my hands. That's very sad to me that I never met him. And on the other hand, I did everything in my power to take care of him as well as I could. And I think, I think that if I had made that decision from a selfish place, it would be haunting me right now. And instead, it, it just doesn't. I, I think, I think abortion is fascinating. I think the issues surrounding it are fascinating. I kind of think human, human sexual behaviors and reproductive behaviors are fascinating. Um, so this isn't exactly a new, a new concept for me. It's like, oh, this is, this is just another facet of things that I already think are very interesting. Um, but uh, I'm losing my train of thought. I just. I think if I had done this selfishly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be feeling okay. I wouldn't have gone into that doctor's office and said, yeah, I'm doing good. <laughs> it would have been different. And, you know, I, I don't think that at any point in my life, I'm going to turn around and look back and say, Oh my gosh, I feel so bad that this happened. You know, that I that I made this decision. I mean, I feel pretty upset that my baby died. I'm not happy about that. But am I going to turn around and say I regret the decision that I made in the circumstances that I found myself in? And I don't think I ever will. And I think that that has a great deal to do with what I believe about life and death and the nature of life and death. But it was, it was interesting talking with my aunt and hearing her, her thoughts that reflected my own. When you're the parent of a dying baby, whether that baby is born or unborn, you really do have to do what you believe is right to to whatever extent you can obviously you can't stop someone who's going to die from dying but you you have to do the best you can as a parent and that can take you to some really weird places because <laughs> it took me it took me to some very strange places and that's okay guys later.